Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. God, who at sundry times, in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The title of the message this morning is Christ superiority over the prophets Christ superiority over the prophets during hard times and this is kind of go along with what we we talked about this morning in the trail of blood in which uh, the local church will talk about this afternoon but during the hard times Christians tend to be discouraged in their profession and worse Many revert back to their former life and religion. You have to understand that in the early church, they were persecuted so bad that some of them just, they went and hid. Some wouldn't follow Christ anymore. In fact, the night that Christ was taken, the only one that really stuck by him was John, and then John ended up splitting too. So they didn't stick around. They knew what was going to happen, and their humanity got the best of them. You know, so... They were afraid, and sometimes we get afraid as well. This is what is happening to the Jews of the first century. And the author of the epistle to the Hebrews takes his pen to encourage them, whoever you may think it is. Now, there's controversy that nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, by reading it several times, it sure sounds like Paul. And I may not have been Paul, it may have been somebody else, but it, the experiences and stuff that are listed in there sure seems like that, but I'm not going to say because we don't really know. But the author of the epistle to the Hebrews takes his pen to encourage them. He argued to them about Christ's superiority. That is why the key word in this of this epistle is better, which is used 13 times in 12 verses. So let us meditate on this this morning. And if you, in your own time, read the whole book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1, the whole chapter, chapter 1. And on this truth that we may have strength during hard times and adverse situations, because our time's coming. I mean, it's already been shown us in the scriptures. It's already been foretold. We know that things are going to wax worse and worse. Now, we'd like to think that this election year is going to bring forth maybe good things. But even at that, the, our, the candidate that we would most likely want to see in there, he's not an angel, to say the least. And some of his people that are his spiritual advisors are uh, they may be they should just be thrown in the trash because they're worth nothing absolutely nothing <clears throat> and if that's who he wants to pick then it's up to him but you know they're to us they're 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 not in the position that they should be to be telling us what we should do or advising our president at most what to do spiritually the first point I want to make this morning is the superiority of Christ's word. While the prophet's word is past, Christ is for today. We don't listen to the prophets of old. We listen to Christ. Christ is the person that we want to listen to. Now, we listen to Paul and Peter and John and some of the other ones because they lived during Christ's time. And they're reflecting what Christ taught them. They are in return teaching us in the same manner. But it's all based on what Christ did. 
what Christ said. So while the prophets were God's mouthpiece, Christ is the Word and the Son of God. Nobody can deny that, except there are religions out there that want to do that. Christ's Word is the one that upholds. That is to say, holds together all things. There in verse 3. So his word is what brings it together, holds it together, and keeps us together. Amen. And if we venture away from that, then we're going to be in jeopardy ourselves, in trouble. Christ's word is powerful, saving, and renewing. That only can happen through his word. We should realize the priority and finality of his word for our lives. It is the final authority. God's word is the final authority. There is none other. You know, when I was working, we used, people from other churches would come in and bring a flyer in. Come listen to this prophet. Well, you know, that's all well and good. Maybe it was the prophet and his wife. They're going to come in and they charged. So that's their money making. You know, that's their in, in employment. They're claimed to be prophets, prophetesses, and they, of course, you know, get paid for, for going to churches and doing this, this thing. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that that person is going to be able to tell you that's not already in the, in the Bible, in the Word of God, that Christ hasn't already told us. They're not telling us anything new. I'm not telling you anything new. You know, you hear sometimes that, well, preachers are plagiarists and, you know, they, they're using maybe somebody else's words or somebody else's sermons. Well, <laughs> I'm using the Bible. I'm using God's word. I'm using Paul's words. I'm using John's words. They're not mine. They're not my words. They're their words. This is what they wrote down. But it's up to God's ordained ministers to try to relay what's in the scriptures to them in a way that we can all understand. So it's nothing new. There's nothing, as the Ecclesiastes say, there's nothing new under the sun. There's not one thing that we can name right now on the earth or in our lives that hasn't already been done. I remember teaching a class on it, and I, and I bring this up from time to time, but I remember bring, teaching a class on this, on Ecclesiastes, and I said, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, you know, hands went up and said, well, what about this? What about that? What? Well, one person says, well, what about birth? And I says, well, what about birth? Well, that's new. I says, well, no, it, it's not new. Birth isn't new. It may be new to that person. You know, that's their first child. And I understand that part of it, but it's not new. Being born is not something that's new. And then somebody said space travel. Well, that's not new either. The angels did it from the beginning of time. As soon as they were created, they went from here to there and everywhere. So, I mean, you can argue it all you want to. But Solomon didn't make a, you know, a statement that wouldn't be true. And when he says there's nothing new under the sun, that's exactly what there is nothing new. You're not going to find anything new in the scriptures that's not already there. I mean, you know, there's been movies made and everything where this, you know, where there's these hidden things in the scripture, you know, these secret codes and stuff like that, and Da Vinci Code, all that garbage. There's nothing in there like that. God is plain. God is sincere. He's going to tell us exactly what he wants us to know. We may not understand it. I, under, I grant you that. But he will in time reveal it to us when he feels that we are ready to receive it. He's not going to give us anything that we can't receive and understand right off until we have matured in our Christian life and then he will reveal things to us as we get older, not even maybe older age-wise, but we mature. The more we mature, the more I think God will reveal to us. So, and these things aren't new. See, they're, they're nothing new. So we see the superiority of Christ's word. Christ's word is superior, plain and simple. No preacher, no prophet, no anybody has superiority over Christ's word. The second point this morning is 
the superiority, yeah, superiority of Christ's worth. What is his worth? The worth of Christ's person or personality should be upheld in distance to the prophets. Who comes first? I, we had a man, Brother Reynolds and I, we worked with out at GM, and he put Paul ahead of Christ. That's how he did. He put Paul up there. He's, he's Paul this, Paul that. And Brother Reynolds pointed out to him, says, yeah, but where did Paul learn all that from? See, he learned it from Christ. Well, he wasn't buying into that. It was Paul this, Paul that. I mean, it was, and you can't do that because Christ has the superiority over everything. So the worth of Christ's person and personality should be upheld and distance to the prophets. Prophets aren't got something better than Christ had. The prophets foretold of Christ being, him coming. So why the prophets are God's servants, Christ is the heir. So he is the heir. And because of Christ and what he did for us, we are joint heirs. Heirs and joint heirs with him. So what Christ has, we will have. So while the prophets are creatures, Christ is the creator. See the difference there? Prophets didn't create. Prophets couldn't do anything without the permission from God. So while the prophets fall short of glory, Christ is the brightness of God's glory. See, the problem with the other prophets, you know, when we look back and look at Noah and, and some of the other ones, you know, we even look, you know, going back as far as Adam, the first man, look how he was created. He's created a perfect being. But he fell, so he no longer was perfect anymore. Look at Noah. We would think Noah was found righteous. But then when he came out of the ark, what did he do? He made a vineyard, got drunk, caused sin to happen in his family. And, you know, some may want to say, well, you know, Noah went through a lot. We want to blame all that on him. But if he wouldn't have done what he did, he wouldn't have been in a situation he would. He wouldn't have caused the problem. So are we going to say Noah had superiority because he made it through the flood? Who brought the rain? See, there's the thing we have to look at. Who brought the rain? Who brought the flood? What was the purpose of this? So while the prophets represent God, Christ is God, the Son. So we can't separate the Son of God and say, well, they're equal to the prophets because there are those that do today. In fact, there, there are several religions out there that make Christ equal to a prophet and that we are prophets and equal with Christ. And that's impossible because Christ was the only one without sin. And we know we sin. So we can't be equal to Christ. It was just, it would, it's impossible to do. I mean, if you can say that you're sinless, which I've run across Baptist preachers and some other people that believe that they don't sin or can't sin, then, you know, they're only deceiving themselves. So and when we, while the prophets are empowered, they had the power. God empowered them to do what they did. I mean, we go back through the Old Testament, we can see, wow, look at the things that they were able to accomplish and the things they did. But why they were empowered, Christ has inherent power. And inherent means part of the very nature of something and therefore uh, preeminently characteristic of it or necessary involved in it. Everything that we are, everything that it is, Christ is involved in it. You can't take Christ out of any of it. While we should hear the prophet, we should worship the Son. I'm not saying what the prophet said were no good. Many of them didn't listen to him anyway. But we can still listen to what the prophets had to say because the prophets were there to foretell the coming of Christ. The coming of the Son. But we should worship the Son. We don't worship the prophet. We don't worship Paul. We don't worship John. 
you know, many do, you know, we, you know, the, we were talking about the Catholics this morning. Catholics have St. Patrick's Day and a multitude of other things, and they worship that. But they throw other things in with the mix. And uh, it's, it, people don't seem to be able to separate those things anymore. And Christians should be able to do that. Should be able to separate that. So, and this is the meaning of worship. That is to say, giving God the worth due to him alone. That's worship. God gets it. No one else gets that. We're here today to worship God in spirit and truth. God is a spirit, so we must worship him in spirit and truth. We can't give that to an ordinary person. We can't give that to the pastor. Some people give that to the pastor. Everything the pastor says, you know, when they go out that door, they say, well, the pastor said this, the pastor said that. You know, well, what did God say? See, because the pastor and God may not be on the same page. So we don't want to rely on what the pastor says. I said, I say many times, check me out. Make sure that what I'm preaching, what I'm teaching you is the correct thing. She'd be able to discern that. You still go out there and say, well, our pastor said this morning, you know, it's what the Bible said. And this is what God has said. And our pastor's related, pastor relayed that to us this morning. We can do that, but we don't want to rely on the pastor as the ultimate word. Thirdly and lastly, the superiority of Christ's work. What is his work? Why is it superior? While the prophets convict us of our sin, Christ purges our sin by his sacrifice of himself. See the difference? Remember when Moses was in the wilderness and he went through the flood and he did all these things and God, you know, he says, well, the people are murmuring and they want water. And he says, well, go over right here and give them water. You know, hit the rock. And out of the rock came flowing water for their substance. Well, they continue to complain through the whole 40 years. And, and Moses got mad at him and he smoked the rock out of anger. And it didn't go over too good with God, did it? It went over so good with God that Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. So God wasn't happy. So when, when we think about that, we say, well, I wonder how happy God is with us today. How happy is he with us? We look like we're doing the right things, but are we? While the prophets always fail and die, every one of them is dead, right? Christ is always victorious and is alive again. He died. He went in the grave for three days and he rose victorious and he sits on the right hand of God the Father. He made an intercession. So while the prophet's work ceased, Christ's work is ever continuing today, sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high in his meditorial work, making it sure that we will receive the benefits of his atoning sacrifice. He's making intercession for us. He wants to make sure we have full use of his atoning, you know, uh, prospects there, what he did. He atoned for our sins and that's what he did. And he wants us to make, us, make it known to us that's what he does, did and still is doing. He atones for our sin. Christ is still ministering to his elect today. Regardless of what people say, well, Christ doesn't speak to us. Well, yeah, but he does. Now, he doesn't speak to us like he did to Paul, but he does speak to us through his word. His word is what is effectual to us today. And the only way we're going to understand or know anything is to read his word. You can't avoid that, or you're going to be void of power, void of truth, void of understanding. You're going to be void of all that if you can't get in there and read his word. We do not believe on a dead Christ, but a living, reigning Lord who is our advocate 
That is to say, he is our attorney or defender. Look over here at 1 John in chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. First John chapter one, verse one and two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So we see that. And we should understand that. That, and the word there manifest means it was revealed. It was revealed to us. We should understand that still happens today. It, the word of God is revealed to us. And it's revealed to us. The more we ask, the more God reveals it to us. Now, he's not going to reveal anything that we, he doesn't feel we can handle at the time. But eventually, he will reveal it to us. He will show us. That's why you can sit down and read the Bible and, you know, and say, well, I've read that for years and years and years. And just now understand it, come to the understanding of that. See, in a sense, the Catholics, the Catholics, I don't want to pick, continue to pick on them, but this is what they do. They, they serve, they serve a dead savior because the crucifix itself that they carry around has Christ still on the cross. Do they pray to Christ? No, they pray to Mary. So in their eyes, Christ is dead. Now, yeah, once a year they come together and yeah, he was he risen, but they still put him back there on the cross. So there's a difference between the cross and the crucifixion because crucifixion shows the a, a, a being on that cross. That's the difference between the two. They worship it, but they don't pray to Christ. They don't pray to him. They don't pray to God. They pray to through Mary or to Mary, then she carries it on. And there's nothing in the scripture that gives us that, nothing. So there again, it's the fault of the people that follow these things and not follow the scriptures or follow the word and put Christ in the place where he should be. Superior. Superior over to any, every and all creatures. Sitting on the right hand of God, possessing in, in Matthew 28, 18, which we know to be, the, you know, the Great Commission, all the power means all authority in heaven and earth. Christ has. He has all authority and he's passed that on to his church. That's why we're teaching on what we're teaching on, because the church has the authority by Christ himself. But it's his church. It's not any religion out here. It's his church. It has to be specific. Dispensing grace for whom he died for. There we have to go back and say, well, who did he die for? Well, he died for his elect. All that the father gave him is who he died for. He shed his blood for them. No one else. In other words, no more, no less. Exactly who God gave them is who Christ died for. The world don't believe that. Religion doesn't believe that. The religion believes that he died for everybody. And they're soon going to come to the realization, first of all, at death. Second of all, when the rapture happens. Third, when they die, if they're going to be died during the tribulation period. They're going to come to the realization that, well, that, that's not how it worked. That's not how it is. So we should be careful in the conclusion of this. We should be careful how we listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. If the message and word of the prophets like Moses and Elijah prove powerful. How much more the son who is superior to the prophets. 
Who raised up the prophets? See, prophets didn't raise up themselves. The Lord raised them up. And again, going back, go to Hebrews uh, chapter 2, look at verse 1 and 3. The warning of Hebrews 2, 1 and 3 is very fitting here. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels and prophets was steadfast and varied, and every transgression, every disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? And that's what John says. We heard him. See? We heard him. We touched him. We believed in him. So, beloved, how do you listen to the exalted Christ through his preacher in his church? How do you listen? There's much that we don't know. Much we may never know. But the Lord Jesus will give us all that we need to know. May God bless his word to your heart this morning. Brother Ray.